Welcome to Bloomberg ETFIQ. I'm Katie Greifeld, and I'm all alone today. So let's get right to the biggest stories right now in the more than $12 trillion global ETF industry. And Eric and I, we just got back from the exchange conference in Miami. It was great, and there was a lot of buzz about Bitcoin. We're talking about a literal beach drone light show from Grayscale on the beach. But in just a moment, we're actually going to pour a little bit of cold water on that buzz because we'll be speaking with Jim Bianco, who says that the spot Bitcoin ETFs are a mistake. And we're going to strike a different chord, so to speak, today as we discuss an ETF that's all about the music industry and Eric Valchunas from Bloomberg Intelligence. He's a big Swifty himself, and he joins us right now with a look at the flows. Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. I'm Gen X. I can't be full Swifty, but I, I admire her. Okay, so let's look at the inflows this week. A big theme here is no bonds. Fixed income ETFs were all over the leaderboard last year. Remember TLT in particular? There's only like two in the top 25. That is really interesting to me. A lot of people are just getting FOMO with equities and a little Bitcoin. Those are the two things taking in the most money so far this year. IVV and VU have been in the top all year. If you look at the year to date, they're 14, 14 each. Nothing even close to those. Um, so let's look at the outflows. You can see here LQD at the top. This is a bond ETF. Corporate bond ETFs had a, a moment there for a couple weeks. LQD was one of the leaders. Now that money's coming out. And it just seems like a trend we've seen. RSP also. People try to sort of will a, a regime change over U.S. large caps. Um, it doesn't work out, and they go back to U.S. large caps. It's an interesting kind of situation. No one can kill the large cap king, at least for now. Speaking of killing kings, uh, let's look at the category of the store of value. So Bitcoin ETFs and gold are kind of trying to go after the same customers uh, to a degree. And it's really an interesting year-to-date uh, flow chart here. The Bitcoin ETFs, if you include GB if you X out GBTC, have taken in 10 billion. If you include the GBTC outflows, still 5 billion net flows. Pretty good for six weeks out. Gold ETFs, negative 4 billion. So the Bitcoin crowd loves this because they're not fans of gold in the least, right? But it'd be interesting to see if the Bitcoin ETFs can sort of come up and take over gold, which has $93 billion. So a long way to go, but a good start. What's the phrase? If you come for the king, you, you best, best not miss. miss. All right. I love it. Let's uh, keep this conversation going now with Jim Bianco. He is president and founder of Bianco Research. And I actually wanted to start with a conversation about your ETF, et cetera. But Eric told me I have to start on Bitcoin. I understand that you had some tweets over the weekend that uh, caught the attention of the crypto crowd, basically calling these spot Bitcoin ETFs a mistake. Walk us through that argument. Yeah. yeah. Bitcoin and crypto is supposed to be a decentralized asset. No one owns it. No one can control it. No one can regulate it. But what we're doing now is we're centralizing the ownership of Bitcoin into the hands of a few people. Now, remember, they may represent thousands of the individual investors, but on chain, Bitcoin only sees 10 new owners coming into the market, with the biggest one being iBit or BlackRock. This puts a potential regulatory or a potential problem in this decentralization argument because you're going to have a big, powerful group of owners and they're going to have to abide by their regulators like the SEC and Gary Gensler. And they're already putting rules on them about, you know, which, um, you know, which wallets are allowable, that they won't allow in-kind transfer. And they're putting a lot of rules and that that might cause the crypto community to have to bend to those rules in order to keep the flows coming. So you're centralizing the ownership of a decentralized, decentralized asset. And I just think that's incompatible in the long run if you believe the mission of cryptocurrencies to try and create an alternative financial system. So, Jim, this is an interesting point. And in my tweets on Bitcoin ETFs, I sometimes see some hardcore crypto people actually make that point. They're like, do we really want to give all our money to Larry Fink? That's one of the responses I get. Um, here's my comeback to that and why I was an advocate for the approval, which is the other ways to get exposure if you're kind of lazy and want to have it outsourced uh, were expensive. You know, commissions on an, on an exchange, uh, microstrategy stock isn't exactly direct exposure. GBTC was like a, a closed-end fund. So we were like, well, at least ETFs will give investors the best possible deal uh, in terms of the price tracking the NAV at a low cost. Seems like they're doing that. Um, in that frame of reference, would you have any problem with that, or does that matter? Well, no. I mean, I don't have a problem with investors wanting to buy it through an ETF. I just think that the industry itself and their, you know, cheering this on and wanting this to happen is where I, I'm kind of concerned because 
let's go back. Crypto is supposed to build an alternative financial system. It is supposed to be something different. It's supposed to be decentralized. It's not there. But it can be there if it gets development, it gets more coders, it gets more VC money into it to build out that system. I don't think a, bit, a Bitcoin ETFs and having everybody follow into this is going to make it better. Oh, the price of these coins will go up and it'll be more likely that people want to invest in mm. outside ventures and make it better. No, they'll just say, no, I won't invest in coding. I won't invest in VC. I'll just buy IBIT. Or I'll just buy, you know, uh, one of the other ones and I'll just watch it go up. And that, and that will then retard the progress that this system is going to have. If, you know, to put it in, in crypto terms, if everybody's just going to be a number go up cheerleader. Mm. I mean, yes, I want the price to go up, but I want it to go up for the right way that we're building something of lasting value, not just everybody pile into all these 10 ETFs and let's just see if we can make a run at 70,000, the all time high. And Jim, it's an interesting point. I remember uh, about a month ago, a little over a month ago, when these launched, someone made the point to me that it's kind of funny that all the hopes and dreams of the cryptocurrency industry have just been boiled down into the launch of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Of course, uh, some of these big issuers actually launching it. But let's move on because there are things to talk about other than Bitcoin. So let's talk about bonds because you have an ETF. We're talking about the Wisdom Tree Bianco Total Return Fund. The ticker there is W. TBN, and I think it's interesting. So this is a bond fund, but you don't actually hold the cash bonds themselves. You chose to get your exposure by holding other ETFs. Talk to us about that decision and structuring the portfolio that way. So the portfolio is structured as an index, uh, the Bianco Total Return Index, BTRINDX on your Bloomberg. And uh, we discretionarily manage that index by, you know, picking the correct array or what we hope is the correct durations and weightings on corporates and mortgages and out, um, out of out of index bets like we currently have a 20 percent weighting in short term tips um, as well. Well, when we went through and we decided to how we're going to structure this portfolio, we looked at the ETF community and there's 500 ET, uh, fixed income ETFs, with 600 billion dollars of assets, and they're getting very cheap and they're getting very efficient. And we said, you know, I could do this. I could do this by buying thousands of bonds or I could do this by buying a couple of dozen ETFs uh, and having a universe of maybe 75 or 80 ETFs. And there's a lot of equity funds that do this. But I think the bond market has been kind of sliced and diced up to the point where this has become very, very efficient. Our average cost of all the ETFs we own right now is four basis points. So it has become, you know, it's either that or put together an infrastructure to buy thousands of bonds it's actually almost cheaper in order to uh, and pass that along to the uh, ultimate users to use uh, ETFs. Equities have done this for a while, and now I think fixed income is doing it. And Jim, looking at the portfolio, uh, just glancing at it, looks like it's more on the short end of the curve. You got some intermediate, one long term, but it's only a 3% weighting. Last year, we saw this massive rush of flows into TLT, which I mentioned earlier. TLT was like stuck at number three or two on the year to date chart almost the whole year. Um, what's your take on that trade? Uh, it didn't work. It worked for a little bit. Now it's kind of gone sideways. Um, seems like a tempting trade. You don't really own much of it. What's the thought behind that? Yeah, I, I'm bearish on bonds. And so, you know, here I am pitching a long only index and I'm bearish on bonds. But then that's kind of the point is that by positioning correctly, you'll hopefully be uh, on the right side. I think inflation is going to be sticky and the economy is going to stay strong. And I think you've seen it, what you mentioned about the weekly flows that all the bonds have disappeared because rates have gone up on the 10 year to 4.3 percent. And I think you're seeing a lot of investors starting just starting to pull back on that. So we are positioned short duration versus our benchmark index. We are positioned slightly underweight corporate bonds. We just did that in the last couple of weeks after the big rush of issuance in January and the all time high in stocks. I think that, you know, there's there's some pullback on that. We're underweight on mortgages and structure, but we're moving more towards an overweight. And if I'm right and rates go up, we'll probably start getting longer and longer as rates get higher. But I think the next move is going to be higher. And so we've been outperforming the index or we've been outperforming the accepted benchmarks this year. And even though we're down on the year and I think we're positioning ourselves well that when we get through this up cycle in rates, we'll be ready to actually have some positive return later this year. Right. Well, Jim, we only have about 30 seconds uh, left with you, but I find it really interesting that you are bearish on bonds, that the view is that rates could go higher. Just quickly walk me through what would get us there. What are the ingredients for rates to actually go higher here? Because I speak to a lot of bond bulls at this juncture. 
Yeah, there are a lot of bond bulls out there, but I think that there is no soft landing. It is a no landing scenario fully in uh, the market or the economy is growing at its potential, if not more. We've seen a propensity of people to want to spend more, and that is resulting in that propensity to spend is a choice. People want to spend more. It's not that they have excess savings. And that is resulting in sticky inflation around 3%. That last mile talk that we're going to go to 2%, I think it's going to be woefully disappointed and we're going to be stuck with like a two and a half percent inflation or growth world in a three percent inflation world and that pretends higher interest rates. Well, I'm sure you felt some vindication uh, last week, Ben, with all those inflation prints that we got. But, Jim, we got to leave it there. Really enjoyed this conversation. That is Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Now, coming up, we look at one ETF that's lost almost all of its value in just four years. We'll discuss next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. Time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with NVDX. This is twice the performance of NVIDIA. And it's probably no surprise that this is the best performing ETF so far in 2024. Just so far in 2024, it's actually rallied almost 90%. Of course, we're all awaiting NVIDIA results after the bell today. It's going to be really interesting to see how this ETF reacts. So that's NVIDIA, but let's talk about Dave Portnoy. Of course, uh, some news from last week in the ETF world that Van Eck fined by the SEC uh, over allegations that it failed to properly disclose Dave Portnoy's role in the launch of Buzz. Remember that meme-based uh, fund that launched just a couple of years ago? Uh, Dave Portnoy, when reached for comments, said that that's news to me. I was very transparent the entire time, but Van Eck uh, is going to pay $1.75 million to settle that probe. Let's also talk about black swan ETFs because we're talking about the simplified tail risk strategy ETF ticker CYA. It has had a terrible time since launch, as you can see, falling 99 percent. And the news broke last week that now it will liquidate in March. So let's talk about this more with Bloomberg Cross Asset reporter Denitza Sekova joining us on set. And Denitza, talk to us about what went wrong here. First of all, what is a tail risk fund and why did it not work? Yeah, maybe let's start with more broadly, tail risk funds try to protect against the 20-30% market loss. So obviously a huge drop in markets that is happening like 2008, 2020, uh, and even the bear market in 2022 wouldn't qualify for this because a slow grinding market lower won't really count as a tail risk event. So this only works in a very few situations. What happened to SIA? Um, is it actually there hasn't been anything like this for quite some time. So the way it works, they buy options that protect in a situation where there is a severe drop in equities or a huge spike in VIX. You can see where the VIX is, the S&P is climbing to record highs, nothing like this happening. And the broader category, there is a similar fund called TAIL, um, has been tumbling. That fund is doing a little bit better, but still, uh, since inception, it's down 50%. Assets in both have tumbled. Tail used to have 500 million, now we're down to 90 million. SIA used to have a, a little bit above 100, and now we're down to 2 million. So investors are getting out of those products. It's interesting, you know, CYA had a couple weeks, Katie, where it was up 50% in a week, 35% yeah. in a week. I mean, it delivered. It just wasn't enough of those weeks. And for a product that doesn't have a lot of volume like VXX, where people trade it short term, it, it, it can't survive because it, it doesn't have enough volume to attract the trading crowd. And long term, it, the performance is too bad to actually stick this in a portfolio. It seems like it was caught between two worlds. Yeah, exactly. Like if you speak to some of those terrorist people, terrorist hedge funds, they'll tell you this is part of it. Like if you want to buy terrorists, you have to stay for the losses and you have to wait for this huge payout. And it's going to be great. It's going to be worth it. But it, are you saying that to a retail crowd? Because then can you really suffer those losses. If you're a pension fund, then maybe it makes sense. It makes sense to have big losses and then when the, the, the big payout comes, you can actually pay your pension. So it's actually good for an institutional investment. But for retail, it's very hard. And then day trading it, it's also like it's so hard. It's almost impossible because the idea is that something unexpected happens, something that happens once in a decade. So how could you possibly time this? It's almost impossible. Right. Well, it's a great piece, great conversation there with Denitza Sekova of Bloomberg about the demise of that tail risk fund.
Now, sit ahead, we'll move to a different kind of beat with David Schulhoff and his fund that tracks the music industry next. This is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. It's time for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, hit it. Katie, today we're looking at MUSQ, music, uh, the Music Global Industry ETF, which is a, it's not active, it's a classic thematic ETF, but the index was designed by an actual music industry executive. Um, back in the day, there was the Quincy Jones ETF that was filed, but never launched. So this is really the, the first and only one on the market now, if you're interested to get exposure here. It's 78 basis points, so it'll probably need some outperformance to make people uh, get over that. And then the, um, uh, it's about a year old, a little bit, uh, a year and a half, six months actually. Uh, let's look at the performance here. This is going to draw from basically a, a group of uh, stocks and it's going to look for companies that derive a lot of their revenue from the music industry or are the top five in that industry. And you'll see you're going to get a lot of big names here. Obviously, you're looking for Spotify, Universal. Um, but then you've got some big names in here. Obviously, these are big players in the music industry, so you kind of have to have those. It is market cap weighted, so you're going to get a, a lot of more uh, big bulk beta in here. Uh, let's look at the performance of this. It's still pretty new, six months old. I don't really know what to compare it to, so I put it against the S&P, and I also put it against K-pop, which I guess you could say is the first music industry. This is entertainment in South Korea. This has had a rough go, K-pop. So music is flat. s and is up 14 um, but it's beating K-pop. So it depends on, you know, what your uh, relativity here is, uh, is for this. But, you know, typically with Theme ETF, probably going to have to see some outperformance over the S&P to sort of get some looks, Katie. But a novel idea. All right, Eric, thank you. And joining us to talk about this ETF, we're joined by David Schulhoff. He is the founder and CEO of MUSQ. Talk to us a little bit about how you put the portfolio together, because a lot of people look at Amazon and say, not the first name that springs to mind when I think of the music industry. Yeah, so I've been investing in the music industry, Katie, for 25 years around public and private companies. MUSQ is the first pure play music ETS, ETF designed to capture growth and innovation in the music industry across five verticals, streaming, content and distribution, live music events and ticketing, satellite and, and radio and equipment and technology. So we have companies like Spotify, like Live Nation, like Universal Music Group, all category killers in streaming, in, in content, uh, and, in, and in ticketing. And we also have, you know, big names like Apple, Amazon, and Google. It's hard to ignore them because Spotify is number one today. They just crushed earnings with 236 million paid subscribers. Apple Music is number two at 110. YouTube is number three. And Amazon Music is number four. So we had to include them. They're all market cap weighted. So the big names are capped at 7%. And so it gives you a really nice cross section of small cap, mid cap, and large cap companies. Uh, on the small side, no company can be smaller than $100 million in market cap and has to have average daily trading liquidity of $500,000 a day. Uh, we've got about 50 companies in the fund. About 40 companies are domestic. 40% uh, are, are domestic and 60% are foreign. We've got exciting K-pop companies, companies in Japan and Taiwan, all around Western Europe. Uh, this ETF is designed to give investors a very portable and convenient way to invest across the entire global music industry. And when we met in Miami, uh, down by the pool, which was a nice scene down there, um, you talked about the revenue. And I was shocked at what you said, because for years, I've been using the MP3 metaphor in my PowerPoint presentations on what the ETF did to mutual funds, because the MP3 really messed up compact disc sales. But you're telling me the revenues have come back and then some. Talk a little bit about that, because I th if it was shocking to me, it might be shocking to other people. Yeah, look, it's interesting. Look, the industry was a $20 billion business in 1999, if you can believe that. And, and that's when Napster came out, right? So it took the, z the revenues to, like, close to zero. And then there was the introduction of Spotify cloud music, iTunes, and the industry rebounded in the last 20 years. So today the industry is a $30 billion business. The entire industry is doubling, right? The, the, whole, the whole music industry today is $80 billion, okay? It's about $30 billion for recorded music, $20 billion for music publishing, uh, and about $30 billion for live music. If you read the Goldman Sachs report, Music in the Year, Lisa Yang, the top music analyst, states that the industry is doubling to $171 billion by 2030. Live music today is up 10 times from COVID, okay? Companies like Live Nation just doubled their output of concerts for 2024. Last year, they crushed earnings because it was a huge year. 
companies like Spotify, right, um, are just beginning to raise rates for the first time. They raised rates by $1 by 10% and they crushed earnings last quarter. Um, so you're going to see all these streaming companies grow. 70% of all their revenues are passed down to all the record companies. And what you're seeing now are all the record labels benefiting from all of the trickle down music from streaming companies. So Warner Music Group was up 18%. Universal Music Group is announcing earnings next week. We'll see what happens. But all these content companies are benefiting by the growth of streaming. So there's a, a guy on my team, and he's like the biggest Swifty ever. He wants to create a Taylor Swift ETF, right? Who are you talking about? Uh, Sebastian. Okay. Yeah, he's in our, he's in our London office. Um, he thinks that she saved the economy. Like, she's even bigger than music. Can you kind of put her in perspective? I mean, what percentage is she of the whole music industry and how much are you sort of trying to piggyback off of her success? In just 30 seconds, too. Okay, so if you read the Luminate report, there were 4 trillion streams, okay, in 2023. She was 5% of all those streams. Wow. So you can, you can do the math on that. So she's had a huge impact, just not on streaming, but also, you know, the impact on the economy and on tours. And uh, she's a force. Yeah, I'm going to write that down, and I'm going to give it to Eric. Uh, maybe you can hang that on your mirror, and you can look on that, uh, that. But David, this was great. Really appreciate you stopping by. That is David Schulhoff of MUSQ, really interesting fund about the music industry. And just a reminder, of course, the ETF IQ, we're going to be back at our regular time next Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern. But in the meantime, if you just can't get enough of ETFs, a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions, of course, their podcast that covers the industry. But that does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld, along with Eric Valchunas, and this is Bloomberg.